Hi, so in the last video we derived the intertemporal budget constraint and in this video we're going to look at borrowers and savers in particular and when we change the interest rate. So we have a diagram here in which we have consumption for some consumer in period 2 on the y-axis and consumption in period 1 on the x-axis. Now I've drawn the budget constraint here as shown by this straight line and we have some indifference curves of the consumer here. We're just going to call this indifference curve I. So we know that the consumer maximizes their utility at the tangency point between the budget constraint and the indifference curve, because this is the highest indifference curve they can get to. So at the optimal level of consumption, we have this level of C1, C1 star, and this level of C2 which we'll call C2 star. Now, what we can draw on this diagram is the initial income of the consumer in these two periods. So, for example, let's imagine that the consumer has income given by this point. Now, income we denote Y, so income in period 1 is there as Y1, and income in period 2 is given by Y2. Now, we note that the income of the consumer is on the budget constraint because the consumer can consume their income and by definition that how much they receive an income they can spend as consumption and this budget constraint just has a slope whoops a slope of 1 plus r or negative 1 plus r as it's sloping downwards and this is how much the consumer can borrow and save at the interest rate. So what do we notice about our consumer whose preferences are given by indifference curve I? Well, we notice that they are consuming less than their income in period 1 uh, by this distance given here by this arrow. And they are consuming more than their income in period 2 given by this second arrow. So this, this quantity here is how much is saved. And so this consumer is a saver as given by the, these preferences and this initial income. Uh, so just to clarify that a bit, the consumer is earning Y1 in period one, but they are choosing to consume only C1 star. This means they aren't consuming all of their income in period one so they save some of this, this income for period two. They save that at interest rate R, and this allows them to increase their consumption in period two from the Y2 to C2 star. So now let's draw up a consumer with slightly different preferences. Uh, again, we'll call this interest or this indifference curve I, and their optimality point is met here at C1 star and C2 star. Uh, but again, let, let's assume we have similar initial income as in the previous example. So in period one, they earned income Y1, and in period two, they earned income Y2. But as you can see, the there is a different shape of indifference curve here. So our tangency condition actually comes on the other side of this initial income. Again, as I said, this income is on the budget constraint, as it always will be, and their optimality condition will always also be on the budget constraint. As we gain more utility from consumption, we always want more consumption, so we will exhaust our budget constraint. So we will move along the budget constraint from our initial income to our optimal condition, but which way do we move this time? The consumer consumes more than their initial income Y1 as C1 star here is greater than Y1. But how can we do that? How can we consume more than our income in period one? Well, we borrow the amount of this arrow here. We borrow this amount. And what are we borrowing from? We are borrowing from period two income. So let's just write that. This is a borrower. And the borrowing, we're borrowing against our second period income. We spend more than Y1 in period one, 
but that means that we have to spend less than our period two income in period two. So as you can see from the y-axis, consumption in period two is less than our income in period two. Again, we have to borrow at the interest rate, one plus r, and the slope of the budget constraint is the negative of this. So our consumption has to be lower by a one plus r fact multiplied by the amount of consumption that is greater than income in period one. So this is the sort of diagram you'll look at when you think of a borrower. Now, it is worth quickly noting that if we look at the aggregate economy, uh, aggregate economy, so we look at everyone in the economy uh, added together, we might have an indifference curve that looks something like this of the whole economy. And the tangency condition here has to be equal to the income of the whole economy. So y2 star is equal to y2 and oops, uh, y1 star is equal to y1. Uh, so I haven't said used uh, the c1 or c2 here because we've aggregated it. So we make it a y. But this basically says that if we look at the whole economy, if we look at everyone added together, uh, our income or our expenditure has to equal our income. And that makes sense. We can only consume what, what we produce. So we have to have in the aggregate that all the borrowers are equal to the savers or whatever's borrowed is saved by someone else. And the way, the way we get to this equality is by adjusting the interest rate, R. So now let's think of what would happen if we change the interest rate. So changing the interest rate would have the effect of moving our budget line uh, to something like this. So this is if we increase the interest rate, this will increase the slope of our budget line. Uh, so let's try to get a bit of intuition as to why this happens. So in the previous video, we derived the intertemporal budget constraint. On the left-hand side of this, the present value of income looked like this. So we have y1 plus y2 over 1 plus r. So this is the present value of income. And what it means is if we increase the interest rate, increasing r, we change this term here, this y2 over 1 plus r. And the way we change it is given by this pivot of the budget line to make it steeper. And so if I make my pen black, we see that we pivot it about the income point or the point where our initial income is because we are on, or that should say C1 on the x-axis. Let's change that. We are in C1 and C2 space, so we're talking about how much we can consume in period one and period two. And if we're at this point Y1, Y2, we are consuming our income. So no matter what happens, we are, we're we not borrowing or saving, we're just consuming what we earn in each period. So changing the interest rate won't change the fact that we can consume that amount because we're not having to borrow or save if we're just consuming our income in each period. However, if we then start to borrow or save and we move away from this point uh, to the left or to the right, let's say, then this we're, we're not going to be able to consume the same amount as our original budget curve or budget set. So the slope changes and it changes, uh, slope changes by a factor of what we've changed the interest rate. As I said before, the slope of these budget curves is one plus R. So if we change the interest rate, we change the slope of the curve. So now we're optimizing with respect to a different budget constraint, but the, the consumer has the same preferences. So we are just moving to a different indifference curve. And in this case, we can, if I can draw this indifference curve, that's a terrible indifference curve, but it will do the job. We move to I2 and we now have this new optimality point here. We've moved from the initial point on I1 to I2 because our indifference curve has, or because our budget set has changed. And we'll notice that this is actually a higher indifference curve. We're increasing our utility. 
And this comes down to the fact that this consumer was initially a saver. And if we think of it intuitively, if we increase the interest rate for a saver, they are going to be happy because they earn more on their savings. So they increase the present value of their income. And this means that they can increase their consumption. So they increase consumption of C2 up to this point, we'll call it C2 star star. And they have increased consumption of uh, in, in period one to C1 star star, although they've only increased it a little bit. Uh, how can we explain this? Well, saving becomes more attractive because there's a higher interest rate, so we have a big increase in consumption in period two. And this comes from both an income effect and a substitution effect. And what we have is a small increase in consumption in period one, and that comes from an, an income effect is the increase, and the substitution effect here is actually negative, so it is a small increase. Now, I won't go into the income and substitution effects in this video. I will cover decomposing those in the next video, so make sure to check that out. So now let's go back to this diagram of a borrower. And again, so the indifference curve has moved and we now have this indifference curve given by this relationship and our tangency point given by a new C1 star and C2 star. So let's increase the interest rate here. And again, this makes the, the slope of the budget curve steeper. And as we explained before, ooh, this was meant to be a line. Let's get a line. This goes through our income point Y1 and Y2. So increasing R will move our budget set to something like that. We pivot around in a similar way to there. And if we look at our indifference curves, uh, given by indifference curve one, this consumer's preferences will give a new optimality condition given by a tangency point about here and this indifference curve will loop around something like this again not very well drawn but i'm not the best at drawing on on the laptop but now we have this new tangency point given here and as you can see we now have c2 star star and c1 star star so what do we notice that this is a lower indifference curve to i1 so we would prefer I1 to I2. We have moved down an indifference curve or to a lower indifference curve would be more precise to say. Why is this? Well, our present value of income is given by Y1 plus Y2 over one plus R, but we are a borrower, as we've said, which means that we were borrowing income from um, from period two to then consume in period one and we are borrowing at interest rate r but r has increased so it's now more expensive to borrow so our present value of income has decreased that means that we have to move to a lower indifference curve because we have effectively got less income so what do we notice here that our consumption in period one decreases a lot so this is from again an income effect and a substitution effect we're substituting into period two consumption and our income effect, we have lower income, so we also have to decrease consumption. However, our consumption in period two has increased quite a lot here. And this is because of a substitution effect because it's more expensive now to consume in period one because of the higher interest rate. And we have to borrow at a more expensive rate to consume in period one. So we substitute our expenditure into period two. And there is also a negative income effect here because our present value income has effectively gone down because we have to borrow at a higher rate of interest. So we effectively have lower income. Now, what's interesting here is that the way I've drawn these curves, we have that our consumer has moved from a, from a borrower and has now become a saver. How do we see that? Because initially we had consumption in period one that was greater than Y1, and now we have consumption in period one that is less than Y1. So this amount 
is now being saved. This isn't necessarily the case. A borrower may remain a borrower, um, but they're just purely taking a hit and the the increase in interest rate just just hurts them and reduces their present value of income. But they may but they they will just borrow less and substitute it into period two consumption. However, they may become a saver and say, okay, this this change in interest rate is so large that actually it makes sense, given my preferences, to start to save money instead of borrowing it, and that and saving at a high interest rate means that I can spend more in period two, which is what this consumer does. So it's not necessarily the case a borrower may become a saver, and it's also the case, well, it, or I should say it's not the case, a saver will never become a borrower because it makes more sense to save more. So a saver with an increase in interest rate will stay a saver, whereas a borrower may remain a borrower or they may become a saver, depending on their preferences. So that just about wraps up this video. Make sure to check out the playlist to see more explanation of the income and substitution effects and decomposing those. Sorry I didn't go into detail as much, but it does get quite complicated, these diagrams and make sure to subscribe for future videos and drop a like if you found this video at all useful.